Good morning, Grade 10s, and welcome to Lesson 15 on Chapter 16 of Finders Keepers. Now, due to the public holiday, it's been almost a week since we last read anything, so you've had a lot of time to be able to catch up on answering your questions. Now, Chapter 15, seen from Mandla's point of view, was a very interesting chapter because we saw a part of Mandla that could be worrying to us and is definitely worrying to Lufuno because we see Mandla here get into a fight in a tavern and that could be read as a very serious mark against his, his name and his personality. But you and I, the reader, understand why he stands up for this little girl that looks a lot like his sister. And he then gets into this bar fight in order to, to protect this little girl in mem in, because she reminds him so much of Nandi. And then he then takes this little girl outside and he says, now go home. And here we see the leadership that his father shows. We now see coming through in Mandla. And he then puts his arm around this little girl and says, listen, you are very drunk. You better go home now. And when he looks up, guess who's watching him with his arm around another girl? Yep, Lufuno. So he runs to where Lufuno is, and when he gets there, she's already gone. Now we know what's going to happen, hey? She is so sad now because she's just seen him with his arm around another girl. So now we will take the the story back to Lufuno, first person narrator, and we now are going to hear how she sees this whole bar fight going down. Chapter 16. It's nearly dark when we get to the party. People are drunk and their faces look distorted in the colored lights. The music is so loud, I can hardly hear Norky and Chantal pointing out people they know. We go over to the bar and Norky gives me a cider. I have never had a whole cider before. It is sour and fizzy. I think of my parents and I shiver. I suddenly feel like I have made a big mistake. I scan the room for Mandla. I can't help it, but there's such a, cr a crush, I can't make anyone out clearly. Everyone is dressed up, except me. In my rush, I had stashed a white t-shirt in my bag instead of the pretty top I had intended. Norky and Chantal assure me it wouldn't matter what and that it doesn't matter and that I was pretty enough to carry anything off. But as I look around, I'm not so sure. All the girls are wearing party tops and tight jeans. I feel something push me from behind. My drink spills down my top, staining the white. I turn to see Cindy with that look of disgust she had on her face the first day she pushed me into the dirt. Oh, look who's here, she says. The rural. Now, remember, we've spoken about rural, and we said that urban sounds like Durban, and Durban is a built-up area. So the opposite of urban is rural, and that will be countryside. So, di Platteland, ne? Oh, look who's here, she says. The rural. I guess you're looking for your boyfriend, or should I say the boy you want. Well, he's just had a fight with another guy over a girl. You'd better join the queue. And she points to the other side of the room. Ah, oh, on second thoughts, I wouldn't bother. I'd go home and change if I were you. Oh, Nuka Saida, you smell like a cheap drunk. I ignore Cindy. Her insults don't sting me like they did on that first day. I don't know whether to believe her about Mandla. She's always causing trouble, spreading rumours, but still, I make my way through the people to see if it's true. A surge of bodies is moving backwards from the centre of the dance floor. I push against the current. I see a tall, thick-set guy with a bloody nose being pulled away from Mandla, who's also being pulled away by his friends. Mandla is trying to break free of their hold so that he can tackle the guy again. And then I see the girl. A girl trying to look older and more sophisticated than she is, and I feel sick. She looks so like the girl on his phone. 
She steps forward and he's putting his arm around her. The girl on his phone is his sister, I tell myself, but I have only his word for it, and I think of what Norky had said. What boy keeps a picture of his sister on his phone? This girl is putting his arm around her neck and helping him off the dance floor. He doesn't see me as he limps past. People fill the empty space again, dancing the step across the floor. I push my way out of the smoke and noise. I have to get outside so that I can breathe again. My head is spinning from the side and I can't see Mandla anymore. He's disappeared with the girl. As I get to the exit door, a man grabs at me and tries to pull me back in. I push forward, yanking my arm away from his and stumbling out into the night. My eyes are dazzled by the disco lights and it takes a while to adjust to the dark. I see couples kissing in the yard of the tavern, people walking by in the street taxis, hurtling past. As I reach the gate, I take one last look back. There is Mandla, standing under the exit light, looking drunk and disheveled, untidy and messy. His face is bruised and his clothes are stained with blood. That little girl is next to him, he looks in my direction and I want to duck, but it's too late. He's seen me and starts walking towards me across the yard. I turn and run, only stopping when I'm out of the sight and around the corner. I came here with Chantal and Norky, but now I am alone, which is the way home. I take a turn one way, but the houses look dark and strange. And there's an old and twisted and misshapen old tree on the corner that I've never seen before. I turn back along another street, but it seems even less familiar. Perhaps I should return to the party and ask my friends to take me home. But now I'm so lost I can't even find my way back to the tavern. A car screeches past and I freeze on the side of the road. A drunk guy staggers towards me. I stay as still as I can and somehow he doesn't see me. I'm alone in the dark, lost and terrified. I take out my cell phone, but who can I call? A wave of panic engulfs me. Then I hear the thumping beat of a taxi. Maybe I can flag down the driver and ask him to take me home. I step out into the road, my arm outstretched. The driver takes the corner too fast and the taxi comes straight at me and I'm blinded by the lights. Brakes screech and I fall backwards onto the pavement. I hear the crunch of metal, the dull thud of bodies hitting the glass and shattering it, and then a scream that goes on and on. Dudu! My scream pierces the darkness. The taxi has sped off. I start shaking uncontrollably. Someone is coming towards me. He sits down on the pavement and lifts my head gently onto his lap. It's soft compared to the hard tar. His face is blurred as I look up. It's Mandla. Are you okay? Talk to me, Lufuno. I open my mouth, but no words come out. Just choking, retching, vomiting sound. It's okay. Just, just breathe, he says. I can hear the concern in his voice. I feel safe for the first time tonight. Mandla, you're going to be okay. What happened? I saw you disappear. I know how dangerous these streets are after the dark. I was about to come after you when Norky and Chantal found me. They said they had lost you in the crowd. That's when I heard the taxi and the scream. I thought you'd been run over. But I heard a crash. I heard the screams. That was you screaming. The taxi's long gone. There's no crash. Where's Dudu? I look up into his face. Who, who's Dudu? Mandla asks softly. You, you screamed her name. She's my best friend. He holds me as I start to sob, and then he strokes my hair. Once I'm calmer, he lifts me to my feet. Come, let's go somewhere else. He puts his arm around my shoulder and presses me to his side as we walk. I put my arm around his waist and lead my head against him. Outside a closed store, we sit down on some steps, and he holds me close, and I tell him everything. I was meant to be with Dudu, but I was late. We were supposed to be going to the choir practice. 
She thought I wasn't coming and she took the taxi without me. I stop, but Mandla waits patiently and in his arms I feel strong enough to go on. Now, great tens, here for the first time, we're going to hear exactly more about Dudu and about what happened to Dudu. And we're going to understand why Lufunu has such pain when she thinks of Dudu. So I'm going to read that to you again. She now tells Manla that one day I was meant to be with Dudu, but I was late. We were supposed to be going to choir practice. She thought I wasn't coming and she took the taxi without me. I took another taxi. I heard the crash before I saw it. There were bodies on the road and screaming and then sirens. The taxi had hit a truck head on and rolled. The metal was crumpled. And then I saw Dudu lying on the tar and a man in a uniform was covering her with a blanket. And I knew what it meant. We know that as soon as somebody has died and passed away, you cover their body and their face. And now she sees a man in a uniform covering her best friend's body and face, and she realizes that Dudu is dead. There, it is all out now. For so long I have expected to hear her friendly knock on our door, to see her there with her hands on her hips and a smile on her face, Good morning, Makwebo family. This is the first day of the rest of your lives. But now I have told Mandla, I know it is time to let go, to stop pretending that Dudu is alive somewhere waiting for me. We sit in silence for a few moments and then Mandla says gently, I'm sorry, and I can hear he really means it. I know what it's like to lose someone. Mandla's voice is unusually quiet, tentative, hesitant, and without confidence. I think he's going to tell me more, but he pulls me to my feet and we walk again, arm in arm, back to my street. It's the early hours of the morning now, the moon is fading. I have his jacket around my shoulders for warmth and his arm around me as we stop outside the spas at the top of my street. Did... Nandi died too, I ask, holding his hand. Is that who you lost? Is that what you were going to tell me when you said you know how it feels to lose someone? Last year, she was my sister, but she was also my best friend. How? I know it's okay to ask now. Asthma, it was my father's fault, and I feel his body tense next to me. Your father. Ding, 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 ding. Ah, the penny drops, great tens. Now we realize why Mandla hates his father. Let's hear what happened. She often got asthma. She was a quiet and anxious person. My father would get impatient with her asthma attacks, tell her that her panicking was just making them worse, that it wasn't serious. Then one night she got really bad. My father was due to attend some function in a nearby village and my mother begged him to stay. But he went out, saying that he had to go. He had been invited as the chief. Of course, he could have stayed behind, but he chose duty over loyalty to his family and love for his daughter. And it was only my mother, Nandi, and my two little sisters left behind. There's no cell phone reception there. Mandla stops talking. I can see he is trying to fight tears. I don't say anything or do anything. I just wait until he's ready to carry on. Nandi had a bad attack, very bad. And there was no one to take her to hospital. My little sisters tried to get help from neighbors, but our nearest neighbor's bucky was broken. And by the time they found someone with transport, it was too late. She died on her way to the hospital. I feel a wave of sorrow, not just for Dudu, but for a girl I've never met, who meant the world to a boy who now means the world to me. And I know now why we have found each other. I've never told anyone the whole story, he says. My mother is terribly angry still, and I know my father feels guilt, 
but he's not the kind of person who admits it. We walk in silence for a moment. Then, as we approach my house, I say, I thought the girl at the party was Nandi. I thought you'd lied when you told me she was your sister. He stops in his tracks. Seriously, you thought I was with that little girl? She was just 15 years old, and she was getting herself into trouble, and she reminded me of Nandi. Then he bends down and kisses me. You are lovely, Lufuno, he says, and you need to learn to trust me. Then he kisses me again. We hold it onto each other, reluctant to separate. I get my key out of my pocket, and he waits until I'm safely inside my house before he leaves. I tiptoe across the room and crawl into bed next to Tulitzi. She stirs in her sleep, but doesn't wake up. Yo, great ten. So chapter sixteen is a revelation of the whole novel. It's in chapter sixteen that we learn so much about why Lufuno is what Lufuno is and why Mandla is and why he behaves towards his father the way he does. We know now that Dudu was her best friend in Josie. Oh, the spell. We know now that Dudu was Lufuno's best friend in Josie and she was killed in a car accident or in a taxi accident. We know that Nandi really was Mandla's sister and that she too has passed away after a severe asthma attack. And we know now why Mandla feels and behaves towards his father the way he does. Mandla blames his father for choosing his chief duties over the family. So that is all I'm going to read to you today, please. I'd like to ask you to please stay up to date with the answering of the questions. So good morning and thank you, everybody. The girls can go and the boys can follow. I will not see any of you tomorrow, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Thank you.